Python allows you to do some really magical stuff with your code. Some of that magic can even be found in the standard library. Have you ever used the data class decorator from the data classes module and thought, well, 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 how do you work, you gorgeous little beauty? No, me neither. That would be weird, but I have looked into how the data class decorator was created. And today I'm going to teach you how to make your very own data class clone using class decorators and just the pinch of metaprogramming. If for some reason you've clicked on this video without knowing what the data class decorator is, allow me to explain. The data class decorator is one of Python's most useful built-in features. By using it to annotate a class, you can skip a lot of the boilerplate that usually comes with using classes. Instead of writing a dunder init method on your class with all your property setting logic, you simply list your class's properties and their types in the class body like so. The data class decorator will do all the hard work of generating a dunder init method, as well as a couple of others such as a repr method and a dunder eq method for equality. We're going to focus on writing the init method today, but once you're familiar with how this all works, it's really easy to extend to other custom methods. And if you're unsure how a decorator works, here's a quick 101. A decorator is just a function that takes in another function or a class and outputs a new function or class. They're often used for things like performance monitoring, as you can execute code before and after each function call. The at decorator syntax is just syntactic sugar for calling the decorator function with the function or class defined below it, and you could achieve exactly the same effect by using code like this. Now that we know what decorators are, let's see what using decorators with classes gives us. I've created this empty person class for now, and I've also decorated it with this my my data class function, which takes in a type and returns a type. All it's doing for the time being is printing the dunder dict attribute of the type. If we run this, we get some basic metadata about the class, but nothing particularly useful yet. However, if we add some data class style annotations to our class and rerun, the output now contains this dunder annotations dict with the annotations we've added. Interesting, maybe we can use that to construct our dunder init method later. Speaking of our init method, how are we going to create that? Python, unfortunately, doesn't have a great way of constructing functions programmatically, which kind of makes sense. You need some sort of function body. The only real way to do it is actually to execute some arbitrary Python code at runtime. And before you start shouting at your screen, this is exactly what the standard library data class decorator does. So if you want to shout at anyone, go and shout at the team of people much smarter than me who work on that. So what it's going to come down to is creating a Python function in a string, executing that string, then assigning that to our decorated classes init method. I'm going to do this in this new init multi-line string. And for now, let's just create an init method that prints a little message. Then we use Python's built-in exec function to run the code. This will load the function into our local variables dictionary, which we can access with the built-in locals function and assign to the dunder init of our class. If we run this code and instantiate a person object, we should see the print statement we expected. Fantastic. Now all we have to do is create a couple of functions. One to create a string representation of our parameters, and one to create a string representation of the code that assigns those parameters to our object. And once we include those in our function definition, we can create John, a 20 five year old person. This is all well and good, but the original data class decorator allows us to have default values for our fields. Let's see what happens to the dunder dict of our class if we add a default age of 25 to our person. It's not included in the annotations. Instead, there appears to now be an age key in the root dictionary with a value of 25. We can definitely use that. We could just add a default value age in our create parameters function and be done with it, but this could cause a problem. For that to work, we need to have a string representation of our default, and not every default value will have a string representation representation that can be used to reconstruct the value exactly. I'm thinking things like custom types where we don't have the class in scope, or even simple things like an empty set, which has to be created with the set function. Instead, we're going to be a little clever. We're going to define a couple of classes. The first of these is just a sentinel value, which we can use in place of something like none to allow us to mark fields that do and don't have default values. We use this instead of just using none, as some users might want to use none as their default. We'll also define a field class, which will serve the same purpose as the field class in the data classes library, or Pydantic if you've ever used that. This will have three properties for now, a name, a type, and a default, which will default to our default sentinel value. That's a lot of defaults. The next step is to add a new pass fields function, which takes our class and creates a dict of field object. If the value has a default, the field.default property is set to that, else we set it to the sentinel value. Back in our decorator, we assign this newly created dictionary to the underscore fields private property of our class, so that we can access it later. We'll then modify our create parameters function. If there's a default present on our field that isn't the sentinel value, we default our parameter to default sentinel and track that our default values have begun. I know that's a little confusing, but this way we can assign none if the user passes that as their argument. Otherwise, our default string is empty and we raise a type error if things are out of order. Finally, in our create assignments function, we check if the value of 
underscore fields is the default sentinel, and if it is, we set it to the default value from the underscore fields property. Otherwise, we just use the value passed into the function. I know it's all a little confusing, but all the code is on GitHub and linked in the description for you to browse at your leisure. And while you're down there, you might as well subscribe, right? Either way, we can now set a default age and the initialization should work with just one argument. We do have a problem with this implementation though, and it's one that the standard library data class implementation also faces. We can't use mutable values as defaults, at least not unless we want those values shared. For example, let's add a friends property to our person, which is a list of strings and defaults to an empty list. We can now create two people, John and Mary, who will both use the default list of friends. As you can see, they both have no friends. If I suddenly decide I like John and become his friend, I'm suddenly Mary's friend too. This is because the list instance is created when the class is created, not when individual objects are created. Thus, it's shared, as Python treats variables containing this list as pointers to the underlying memory, rather than copying the list each time you assign the variable. The standard library data class decorator gets around this by allowing you to provide a function to construct your default value using the field constructor. However, I've always found this clunky, and I don't really like it. We can do better. Let's start by importing the copy library inside the code of our dunder init function. Then, in our create assignments function, instead of just using the field.default value, we can use the copy.deepcopy method to create a deep copy of the object and assign it to our class. Now, if we rerun our code, our friends are no longer shared. That's a great thing, probably. The last thing I want to implement is quite simple, but very powerful. The standard library data class ships with a way of running code after instances of the class are constructed, once all the values have been assigned. They call this the dunder post init method, and we're going to copy it. It's actually really easy to do. In the body of our init function, we just check if the class has a dunder post init method defined and call it if it does. We can now add a post init method to person and voila, it gets called by both John and Mary upon creation. While this hasn't been a complete rewrite of the data class decorator, hopefully you've learned enough to be able to go away and use class decorators yourself. If not, I hope you've learned at least a little something about metaprogramming and come up with some clever ways of using tricks like this in your own code. Just be wary of being too clever. If you don't know whether you need to use metaprogramming tactics, you probably don't. The people using it know with 100% certainty that there's no other way of doing what they're doing. If you've watched this video, chances are you're basically a Python expert, but you might still enjoy my video, my step-by-step -step guide to absolutely mastering Python, which you can find right here.